Dr. Jeffrey Golden and uh, hear about the precision medicine topic. Are the new slides loaded? Or are they gonna... while they're bringing up the slides, um, I'm going to start out with a question for everybody. Um, I need a daring person to tell me what is precision medicine. Use of genetics and genomics in an individual's health care. Okay, what's personalized medicine? So, medicine directed to a individual for their personal needs. So, what's the difference between genetics and genomics for an individual and medicine for an individual? The Venn diagram. Okay. So, you're using the genetics and genomics to help identify the essentially the phenotype of the patient. You're using the personal that information to then personalize the care. For example, if you have a drug that's only effective with 85% of the population, you need to identify, are they in that 15%? And if they are, give them something else. Okay. Did everyone hear that? Want to repeat it? Okay, it's basically <clears throat> almost pharmacogenomics. Matching together the genetics, the, the makeup of an individual with specific drugs for that individual. So what I want to do today is take you through at least my definitions of these. And in doing so, give you a little bit of um, insight into how we're approaching implementing a precision medicine program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital across the Dana-Farber and Partners Healthcare. And what I want to start out by saying is I don't get caught up in semantics. So I'm going to tell you what I think personalized medicine is and precision medicine, but if we went around and asked everybody in this room, we'd get plenty of different opinions. And, and I don't think that that's important, but I think you'll understand the concept of what I'm trying to do. So let's start out with personalized medicine. To me, personalized medicine is about an individual. It's about me. It's about each of you. It's personal, okay? And I think we can really delve into that and understand it if you look at some of the things we do, particularly around cancer, but I'm going to come outside of cancer. So let me give you a couple of examples, and I think these uh, examples are quite illustrative of the value that personalized medicine brings. And then we're going to go to precision medicine. <clears throat> so here's an example. This is a 52-year-old woman. She was diagnosed in 2004. 2004 is very important because that was the year that EGFR inhibitors were identified, and EGFR, this mutation that leads to activation of a signaling pathway, was shown to drive lung cancer. Before that, lung cancer was basically, I mean, it was almost a death sentence for patients. This person was diagnosed with stage four metastatic lung cancer in 2004, and with that diagnosis, she had less than a 1% chance of living for even a year and a half. But as you can see, two years later, and I can even point out, see, I do have a pointer. Here's the tumor. You can see it in the back of her lung here. And it's completely gone. And that was from treating with a drug. Okay? And even uh, what happened, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but I think it's very important, the, the point will become very important. This is EG, an EGFR inhibitor. After this two years, it actually started growing back a little bit. We sequenced that tumor and found a different mutation in that same gene. And there was a new drug that had come out that targeted that specific mutation. And now, four years later, 
she has a little scar there. And actually, this, this person lived for 10 years, unfortunately, eventually passed away. But for 10 years, when she had a life expectancy of a year and a half and high quality of life, because these specific targeted drugs often have far less of an effect on your body than chemotherapy, which is, hits every part of your body. OK, so this is one example. Let me show you another one. This is a, a relatively young man, younger than me, so now young, 42 <laughs> years old. Um, now, he was diagnosed outside of our institution with an, what was called atypical small cell lung carcinoma. This is a type of cancer that, when first diagnosed, is usually very treatable. Usually, it starts to melt away right away with traditional chemotherapy. But it is horrible in that it comes back pretty quickly. And it's very hard to treat. Okay? Now, in this case, the patient went on therapy and did not respond initially. So not only was it described as atypical based on looking at the pathology, but also he was responding atypically. So they sent the patient to us. And when we got the patient, we looked at the genome of that tumor, and we said, hey, this has a really unusual mutation. And this mutation is not one we expect to find in small cell carcinoma of the lung. This is a mutation we find in a Wilms tumor. Uh, sorry, Ewing's uh, sarcoma. Ewing's is unusual. It's unusual in the lung. It's unusual at this age. But that characterized that tumor as Ewing's. And there's a completely different therapy for that. This person went on that therapy and actually responded brilliantly. So now by looking at these individuals, the first one, it allowed us to identify the right drug for that person by the mutation that was there. In the second case, it gave us the right diagnosis for the individual to get them on the right therapy. So how do we do that? Well, we do it using something we've developed in our department called OncoPanel. It's a, uh, not important all the different genes, but we uh, look at right now 309 genes. In about a week and a half, we're going to be going to a 449 gene panel for every single cancer that comes in and is diagnosed. Okay? So this is what we do on each of those. And what we know from doing this, and we have now done this, in over 17,000 tumors. Okay, it's actually the largest total experience in the United States in an academic center. And we know it works. We can get this to work 95 or better percent of the time. We find common things commonly. But very importantly, we find unexpected things. We find, for example, uh, these very unusual uh, uterine tumors that are hypermutated. It turns out they had what's called a Paul E, a polymerase E mutation. And when we identify those and find those mutations, we actually know those patients do much better than most uterine types of carcinoma. And we can treat them differently. We also get unexpected findings. So sometimes we find um, a mutation in a bladder cancer for a ALK, an ALK mutation, for example, where we have a drug we don't expect that in a bladder cancer. It's not usual. But now we can treat that patient, and they respond very well. So there's a tremendous amount that can be done when you look at the individual. And I call this personalized medicine. Now let me, let me just uh, finish with a couple more examples. The, this panel that we developed is great. But we have to take care of our patients. And patients with hematologic malignancies like acute leukemias, they have to be treated within two weeks with this very specific targeted therapy. Okay, every single patient with acute leukemia that comes in, when they're newly diagnosed, they go on the exact same therapy for the first two weeks. And then it switches over to something that's very specific for that type of leukemia. The panel that we develop takes about three to four weeks to get results back. And so it's no good for this. Well, we've developed a specialized panel for just this kind of cancer, these hematologic malignancies. It's about 95 genes. We do it in a, on a slightly different platform. 
and it allows us to target the therapy. And in this case, this was a, um, oh, sorry, in this case, <laughs> this was an 18-year-old gentleman. He was actually being sent to hospice, responding very poorly for his acute leukemia. And we identified a uh, mutation in the notch genes, in the notch pathway. And there were uh, trial drugs that were available. We put it, this uh, individual, and this individual's home, he's actually uh, doing incredibly well. This is a, um, uh, it's not on here, but he's out running and doing things. This person was being sent to hospice at this time. This and so, so what? Well, I think these illustrate a few important points. Known mutations can be specifically treated. That was that first lung cancer I showed you. It gives you more precise diagnosis, again, for the individual. That was the second atypical small cell carcinoma. Superior treatment strat stratification, getting patients on the right clinical trials. That was that acute leukemia that I showed you. Okay. So these targeted therapies that are all the ones that I just talked about, because of these, end up giving you more effective therapy. They're less toxic. When we give, most chemotherapies do things like um, stop cells from dividing, and then it destroys your entire gut, your skin, everything. It causes all kinds of problems. These therapies are much better. They're much more targeted and much more specific. We have better outcomes. I show one example over here. I'm not going to go through the data of this. And they're more cost effective. So these therapies can be quite expensive. These therapies can be $100,000 a year. But in fact, what several studies have just shown, a beautiful one out of Intermountain Health from Utah has just shown is that the patients go to the ER less, they spend less time in the hospital, they spend more time at work, they spend, uh, and they survive longer. It does not take a long time to uh, be out of the hospital for a few days, not have to go to an ER to make up $100,000 in therapy. It actually goes very quickly. So they are actually more cost effective. And by doing this, we've discovered new biomarkers that have helped us in the identification of other tumors and in other patients. And of course, this isn't just for cancer. So um, in this example, this little baby was born to a um, family who had had a previous pregnancy that had a really horrible outcome. And the family was devastated, and they did severe malformations. They did not want to, they wanted another pregnancy, but they did not want to have to go through that again. So uh, this person, whoops, uh, Cynthia Morton in my lab and Charles Lee, or in my department and Charles Lee, developed a methodology using sequencing to identify all micro deletions, translocations, and everything in the entire genome. We were able to find what the problem was in the parents. We were able to find out what went wrong in the child. And we could screen and show that that child did not have it. And they were able to carry that pregnancy forward and have a happy family. So you can do this not just, I didn't do it. <laughs> but the, the point of this is that it's not just for cancer. This is for all kinds of therapy. This is personalized. You have to do it for each individual. Okay? That's not where I want to take you. I think it's important to understand what we are doing now and what can be done now. But let's now talk about, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, here's the challenges. For doing this, there is way too much data, and you all know this better than I do, but there's way too much data that come to clinicians. A busy clinician who um, orders a series of tests and gets it back and has 15 minutes to see a patient can look at five pieces of data. That's been proven. Uh, AROP's done a beautiful study on this. So, you know, I go to my physician each year. They uh, get a CBC, a complete blood count. They get a panel 7, which is a metabolic panel. They get a lipid panel. Um, now they get a PSA on me. Um, because I'm that old, and 
you end up with um, about 30 different parameters that they have to look at. They can use five. The rest of that data is not used. Okay? So somehow we have to figure out how to do that. And the tests that I was just showing you, where we sequence entire genomes or panels of genes, which come back in these fairly large BAM files or BCF files, if you gave those to a clinician, it's worthless. It's worth nothing at all. They could do nothing with it. So we have to somehow convert that data into information.